Good morning. Good morning. For those who do not know me, uh, <laughs> I am Pastor Jeff. Glad to be back. Um, three words I would describe my time away. Thank you so much for giving me that privilege. Um, it was restful, enjoyable, and meaningful. So maybe I can unpack that sometime later, but I'm glad to be back. Glad to worship with you. We found I did miss worshiping with you uh, throughout our three months. That's probably the biggest uh, part that we missed, um, just to be with you guys on a Sunday morning. But thank you again just for the privilege of being away. Um, so be patient with, with me as I get acclimated to uh, <laughs> what it means to work again. <laughs> um, Retire, those who are retired, I can understand kind of that routine's pretty, pretty sweet. Um, all right. Uh, I've, I, I'm thankful for all the people who preached also. I'm thankful Gary can be here again. Uh, Gary, we've been friends for almost 40 years probably. Yeah, so it's good to have him come and to share, your word, share the word with, you, with, him, with us again today. Uh, a couple announcements. We do have the women's treat coming up. If there's a flyer in the North X, this blue flower, if you're interested, please grab one. Um, they're doing hard work of planning. They've been, been planning for a f few months now, so um, I know it's going to be a sweet time. My good friend, Nairi Arhanian, is going to be the guest speaker. Uh, you'll love her. She's uh, exuberant. She's passionate. She loves the Lord and loves the church. So I'm, 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 look, I would encourage you to take advantage of attending that time. Also, um, there is blood drive coming up. In two Saturdays, it looks like, the 24th, so mark your calendar for that. And um, also, there is a reception for someone who just came back, for Val and I who just came back, so um, you're welcome to join us in the Welcome Center for that. Uh, it's no, never too early to think about Christmas, and so uh, Janet Lee is going to be talking about some service ministry that we can do. Thank you. Good morning, church. Morning. That was awesome. Um, I'm... I have never stood on this side of the, of the church before. Anyway, I am here to talk to you about Operation Christmas Child. And for those of you all that are like, oh no, it's Christmas in August. Yes, it's really, for some of you all and for me, it's been Christmas all year because I've been purchasing stuff for Operation Christmas Child all year. Whenever I see a bargain, I buy it. And if any of you all know, I was talking in the staff meeting about this um, this past week, but the choir room has kind of become the Operation Christmas Child room. <laughs> there is stuff down there. So don't think that just what's in the bins out here is, um, is where it's, it's being kept. We have stuff downstairs. So right now, we have school supplies that are on sale. I don't know if any of you all have been school supply shopping, but what I'm, what I'm wanting to do right now is do, a, is do a big pool for school supplies. So if you're out and you see notebooks, pens, pencils, erasers, pencil sharpeners, glue sticks, we don't want to do anything liquid, but um, anything school supply that you may want to bring in to put in these shoe boxes. For those of you all that don't know, we pack um, shoe boxes for Samaritan's Purse. It's through Compassion International, but we do these shoe boxes, and we have currently out there in the narthex we've got um 250 boxes to be assembled and there's another 100 downstairs i'm not pulling those out yet but we have boxes to assemble we're going to assemble some at trunk or treat this year um and start filling stuff with school supplies so if you all happen to be out and you're like let me just grab 10 extra notebooks or a box of pencils or something we would love that and there's two red bins out there that you can just put them in when you come in on sunday or come in during the week if you happen to stop by and then we'll pack officially in November. Like we'll get all the, anybody that wants to help out, we'll come in and we'll pack shoe boxes with everything else. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Great. One of the great honors we have as believers, as sons and daughters of the living God is to worship. So let us stand and let's um, receive this dialogue that God has with us to worship him and him alone. We come to worship the Lord. Our God formed the world and brought the mountains and the hills. Each morning God meets us with his steadfast love.
So let us sing boldly, How Great Thou Art. come here this morning to acknowledge the greatness of you. You're the one who, who created the heavens and the earth. You're the one who created us uniquely and wonderfully. God, you're great because then you brought us Jesus, who's the one who has saved us from all our sin and brokenness. How great you are to, to think of us and in such a merciful and compassionate way that you would send your very own son 
to die for my sins and our sins here this morning. Father, you're so great that that you don't just leave us here on earth that one day that we will be united with you in the new heavens and the new earth. And until that time, you're at work actively making us more and more like Christ. And Lord, all we could do is to sing how great you are. So this morning, move us and, and, and remind us and empower us and to convict us more and more of the greatness of who you are, God. We've been learning that you're a God of love, that you're a God of justice and mercy. You're a God of compassion. You're a God who's all-knowing and all-seeing. You're a God who's eternal. And so help us this morning to be blown away by the, the awesomeness of who you are, oh God. Do that work of grace, I pray. Continue to bless as we, as we declare your glory, declare your goodness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, gracious, everlasting, forever eternal God, you know all about us. You know our thoughts. You know our thoughts even before we know them. You know us thoroughly, Lord, and yet you still choose to love us. You still choose to save us. You still choose to make us more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. In blessing and in tragedy, Lord, you are still our God who deeply cares and loves and ministers to us. We are forever thankful that we serve a forever God. Thank you that we belong to you now eternally. Thank you that you will not be lost, but Lord, we are ever, ever your children. And we thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated as we come now to the time where we confess our sin before the Lord, a time where God gives us this privilege to acknowledge those areas in our life where we have fallen short of his glory. This prayer is adapted from the Geneva Liturgy of 1543. So pray along with me. Our Lord God, eternal and almighty Father, we confess and acknowledge before your holy majesty that we are poor sinners, prone to do evil and incapable of doing good for the right motive. We have often transgressed your commands by putting our wants and desires before you. O oh Lord, we are grieved that we have offended you. We condemn ourselves and our sins with true repentance, beseeching your grace to relieve our distress. O oh God and Father, most gracious and full of compassion, have mercy upon us in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As you blot out our sins and stains, magnify and increase in us each day the grace and presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We acknowledge our own unrighteousness with all our heart. We desire that our lives should show true repentance and produce in us the fruit of righteousness, innocence with you, which are pleasing to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Let us now come before the words and confess our own personal silence in silence. Gracious God, thank you for hearing our prayers through Christ. Amen. Now let us stand and hear these words of assurance of pardon from Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 through 28. I will take from you the I will take from you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into our land. And I will sprinkle clear water on you, and you, sh you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put upon within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear and believe the good news. In Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us continue to worship as we confess our faith. It's a part of our MPC statement of faith. Let us say this together, boldly, confidently, humbly. We believe in one sovereign God, creator and redeemer of the universe, who eternally exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, both fully God 
and fully human. We believe that he lived a sinless life on earth in perfect obedience to the Father, offering up his life on the cross as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of all kinds of people. We believe that he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven, where he is seated on the right hand of God, the Father, as our high priest and Lord. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a gift given to all who believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that the Holy Spirit actively resides in the life of every believer as a source of understanding scripture, godly wisdom, strength in daily life and trials, guidance in our relationships with God and others. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us in prayer and is actively working to renew us in Christ and transform us to be more like Christ. We believe that all justification is by faith alone, in Christ alone, something that cannot be earned in all of grace. Through it, we are given access to a right standing relationship with God. We believe that salvation and its resulting eternal relationship with God is offered by his grace through the perfect life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe salvation is received through faith in Christ, repentance, and not by works. And we all say, amen. amen. Please be seated. Now is the time for offering. Are we going to be singing this, or are we just listening to you? This offering. Oh, is it called? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, okay. new song, we will be singing it in a few weeks. Well, you all will be singing it. So we're, um, we're going to sing it for the offertory. It's kind of catchy. I think you all can probably pick up on it. We've got the words on the screen, and they're in your bulletin. So feel free to join us. Oh, 
Christ would be made more. Would I seek the only kingdom that far outweighs them all? I will stand before my Father where the faithful saints have stood, and with joy my heart shall praise Him for His glory. Eternal God, we come bearing these gifts because you are the Lord of lords. You're the King of kings. And out of, out of a ministry of desiring to give back to you, or we, we, we desire to, you to use these gifts that we have given unto you for your glory, to advance your kingdom, for us to more and more declare the goodness and the glory of our God as we see it through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So bless these gifts mightily for your sake and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If Melissa can come up for the children's message. Come on, kids. Come on down. All right, each one of you take one of these and a marker. Can you guys start working on that? Yep, there you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right, I have a few extra. Malachi, if you want to participate, we have one for you. Here comes Jack and Jesse, I think, so they can have two. All right, so we're off to the side a little bit today, not in the very middle. So when you have an answer to put on here, you're going to have to kind of hold it up so maybe more people can see. Is that okay? All right. On your board, I want you to write on in not, don't take the whole board. Jesse, come on over here and grab one. There you go. You're welcome. Okay. You're going to write on there the age that you think a child walks, learns to walk. Then pick a new one. What age does a child learn to walk? Go ahead and write it down. Jesse has a good answer. Okay, if you have your answer, hold it up so people out there can see. You're not sure? Just take a guess, maybe. One to two, eight months, three, two years, two, maybe 
a one, maybe two or three. And Jesse, you're hard to see, but he has a three on there. Dorothy Ellen wrote a two. Okay. <sighs> Parents, adults, this is, we're going to be doing a few more questions about ages. So just to show you, generally, kids think old people are like me. So we're going to see what really happens here. Are you ready? Okay, here goes. At what age, this is another number for you, do you think you are the fastest you can ever be? Like you're the fastest at running and you can win the most races. At what age? 12. At age 12, okay, good, I like it. Remember, the Olympics are going on right now, so think about some of those people at their ages. Oh, 52? You guys, there's still life in you guys yet. All right, um, 25, I, oh, eight to 25. I missed that it was a range. She likes the range, eight to 25. Age 10, okay, good. So the question is, what age do you think you'll be the fastest? You can run the fastest. Oh, do you have an answer? She's thinking on it. I'm gonna give her a minute. Okay, 11, all right. Last one, here's the last one. At what age do you think you're considered old? At what age are you considered old? <laughs> All right, put your, put your number down and then you can show it. We have a 60, sorry all, sorry. <laughs> Never, N-E-V-E-R. Let me see, ooh, uh, 102, yes. <laughs> He wants to be uh, in the blue zones, Mediterranean. Okay, she wrote never. Rose, you have, that's an old, that's a lot of months. Dorothy Ellen says 105. Woo! <laughs> All right, here we go, Dorothy Ellen. 100, uh, 100,000? All right, well, go ahead and put your boards and your markers away for just a minute for me, okay? So what I wanted you to think about is the life of a person, we have what we call like a timeline. When you're born. When you grow up, when you're a teenager, adult, grandma, grandpa, and then you go to heaven. Exactly. So we have a set timeline and like a life cycle. Yeah. I like it. I love when they can throw in their school. So. Uh, like a timeline, right? So we, we are born, and then maybe one of our first milestones that we learn is to walk, and then we get better at walking, and we learn to run, and then we get better at running, and we get to be really fast. Then you, go to the Olympics. Then you might it, go to the Olympics. But when we get older, for some of you, you thought that was like at age 100, okay? And then we die, and what did you say would happen to believers? They go to heaven. Okay, so God is everlasting. And we've heard that word today. It's in our songs. It's gonna be in Psalm 90, which is the, the Bible that we're looking at today with Pastor Gary. We can't really comprehend that as people because we are born and then we live a life and then we die. And in that small period of time, while we are here on earth, it is for us to glorify God. That is our, our main purpose. That's like our big, biggest job that we have. And that's just a very, very, very little portion of the timeline that God looks at. He, he was thinking like everlasting, right? It just means there's really no beginning and end, and God was always there. So for us, even though we have a lot of important things to do, in our timeline and our life, that means glorifying God and telling others about God and living our life that way. I know, it's exciting to celebrate birthdays. So we do have two August birthdays sitting up here. Both Jesse and Malachi have August birthdays. And that's super exciting to be able to celebrate that next age that you're gonna be. 
So guess what? When we are celebrating those birthdays here on earth, you can always give glory to God, right? Thank you, God, for another year. Now, when you guys think about this, what I want you to remember is that everything you do here on earth, it is important. Even if I said it's just a small little portion, it's very important that you are living your life for God, okay? Let's pray together now. Remember, I'm going to collect your markers and your, your boards. Okay. Dear Father, thank you for these families that come to our church. Thank you for any families who are watching online. Lord, we are just so grateful for children and their willingness to learn and to share ideas and that their parents give them that ability to be able to do that, that they bring them here to church where they can learn more. Lord, we just thank you so much for your glory. We give glory to you that you are everlasting that you forgive us for our sins, that you forgive us for our humanness and the errors that we make day after day in our lives. And Lord, we know our lives are so short, so let us live them to the greatest to fulfill you and to tell others about the glory of God. In your name we pray, amen. One quick announcement. I didn't catch the sooner in the bulletin. It says that kids are having, are dismissed to worship and play zone. That is not correct. My fault for missing that. We, we will have Worship and Play Zone on September 8th, so we're still on our summer schedule right now. Just want to clarify, all right? All right, guys, you guys can go back to your pews. Before Gary comes up, let me just have some time of just praying for our congregation as, as he comes up. Gracious God, thank you so much for um, our children. Thank you for each one of them here today. Thank you that you have uh, brought them here and that, Lord, they're learning about you. And Lord, we pray that each one of them would trust you alone for their salvation. I do want to specifically lift up um, the Wilson family. Craig lost his sister. Uh, this week, uh, yesterday morning, we just pray for that family, that you would just continue to care for them, watch over them. May you draw them close and comfort them in their loss. We know that many in our congregation, some in our congregation are just wrestling with many different things, um, some hard decisions they need to face or challenging times ahead. We pray, Lord, that you would just care for them, minister to them. Lord, may you give, be a comfort to them, encouragement to them. May you provide them wisdom discernment as they navigate um, some of this hardness of life um, going on. There are some, some health concerns. We pray you continue to um, bring healing and strength uh, to them and grace as they uh, face um, just the challenges ahead of them and their, and their dealing with specific illnesses. We pray you continue to heal those who've had operations with hip or leg or, or knee. We pray, God, you care for them. Uh, Lord, we know there's other un um, requests that they um, all of us have, and so... We know because you're a God who delights to hear our prayers that we, we can take our anxious thoughts to you. We can take our fears to you. And you actively listen. You help us and you calm us and you give us a peace that only you can give. And so Lord, we pray that for those who are maybe wrestling with um, those kind of uh, concerns in their lives. Lord, thank you so much for hearing our prayers. Thank you for Gary that he can, he can come here now and preach your word. We pray you would speak mightily through him. Holy Spirit, use him to um, and Encourage us in our faith today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's great to be back with you and to be able to share in God's word. I have to say what a blessing it is to have all the service tied together. Uh, we sang Psalm 90, great music. Uh, Melissa shared what Melissa shared with you. You're going to hear some recurring themes as I preach. Um, so it's incredible to be able to kind of bring it all together and as we talk about God. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Psalm 90, verses 1 through 17. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday, then it is past. For as a watch in the night, you sweep them away as with a flood. They are a dream, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. 
For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and as for many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. That's for our hearts in prayer. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. And without the light of your truth, we walk in darkness. And so we ask you to shine the light of your truth in our hearts today, that we may in a very powerful way understand the God that you are and your great love for us through Christ our Lord. Amen. I would say that most of us are familiar with the book of Job and the story of Job and the incredible suffering that he endured. But many of us probably do not know what Job said at the end of, his, uh, end of that book in chapter 42, verse 5, where after all of the suffering that he endured, Job said, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Over the last number of weeks, we have looked at loving God, or God being a loving God. We've looked at the holiness of God, the fact that he is just and merciful, faithful, good. Today, we're going to look at the idea that God is eternal, and in the future, we're going to be looking at the fact that God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and a renewing God. One of the benefits is that when we come to know God more, we become better worshipers. We will become overcome by his greatness, by his majesty, by his beauty. If I know who God is and understand the greatness of who he is and his love for me, I will serve him, I will worship him, honor and obey him. I will stop fighting him because I know that he is for me and not against me. In addition to that, it will give give you greater faith. Because one of the great barriers to Christian faith is trusting God in a world of turmoil. That's what Job went through, didn't he? His life was in turmoil, and yet through it all, he trusted God. And we find that true in our lives, don't we? Tragedies happen all the time. Children die. Natural disasters destroy homes and people. And it's hard to believe in his goodness. The truth is, there are no easy answers. It's about trusting what we know about God and what we believe about him. And so in coming to know God, we increase our faith and therefore our trust. And the key to living the triumphant Christian life comes down to at least three things. First is praising God. Because when you dwell on who he is, you will know he is there for you, and you will know that he takes care of you. Second, trusting in the keeping power of God. And the only way you will trust is if you know who he is. And third is to follow Christ. And how can, can you follow someone you don't know and you don't trust? And so that is why knowing God and his character is so important. That's why we're going through this series of knowing God, because when you understand who God is, you will walk closer to him and you will trust him in living your daily life. As I said, today we are talking about the eternality of God. That's one of those attributes that's hard to wrap our minds around. We certainly understand love because we can love and we know what it is to be loved. We can understand power because we have seen it in its various forms and have had had power in certain situations. But with the idea of eternality, none of us are eternal. And although we have eternal life with Christ, in Christ, we struggle to grasp it. So to start out, let's give a definition that we'll hopefully expound on and give us a greater understanding. The eternality of God means God has no beginning and no end. He is not confined to the finiteness of time or to our reckoning of time. He is, in fact, the cause of time. 
And in addition to that, God's eternality intersects with many of his other attributes. God is independent and has no needs. He's sufficient to himself and independent of anything outside of himself. Another important aspect is that God does not change. He is immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in regard to the fact that he is all-knowing, he sees all time with perfect vividness because he exists above time. And for God, time never passes too slowly or too quickly. A day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. And he is sovereign over time and the Lord of time. Time is God's creation. So our passage today is Psalm 90. I encourage you as we go through various parts of this passage, and you may open your Bible, but if you look on your phone or in the bulletin as it's printed, Moses wrote this psalm, which means it's centuries older than the time of David. Normally, when we think of the psalms, we think that David wrote them all, but he didn't. And Moses wrote this psalm, this psalm probably when Israel was condemned in the desert to wander for 40 years. And so it's the oldest of all the psalms. It's a plaintive psalm. You'll notice that, that uh, Moses complained a lot. Moses is overcome by the futility of life. But it's also a psalm that gives us hope. But the question is, what is life all about? Why should I live and not die? And that's why Moses wrote it. And this morning I'm going to share with you three facts that I think help us to understand the eternality of God. And the first fact is simply this. God exists from all eternity. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So the first fact about God, and it's a repeat of the definition at the beginning, is that God never had a beginning. God is indeed eternal. He will go on forever, and he has existed before time began. Sometimes atheists like to ask the question, who made God? And if you don't have an answer, it gives them an excuse not to believe on him. But there is a legitimate question. Where did God come from? In light of the fact that something exists, that must mean that something has existed forever. Carl Zagan in his book, Cosmos, begins it with the words, the cosmos is all that there is and all that there ever will be. Well, that's unscientific to say that because the universe does not contain within itself an answer to its own existence. Scientists say that it's actually, the world is actually running down because someone, because someone had to wind it up, entropy. Somebody very intelligent and very powerful at least got it going. And so where am I going with all this? And it all comes back to the question of God's eternality. We as Christians believe that God is the uncaused God who created all things. He is the uncaused God who caused everything that exists, and he always existed. Think about that for a minute. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. If you begin with the premise that God exists as he is revealed in the Bible, you finally have an explanation for all kinds of things, reality as we know it. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the fact that God is uncaused. In other words, he's always existed and no one created him. Here he is, this being that permeates the universe and didn't have a cause. Babies have a cause. A building has a cause. A car has a cause. And I'm going to give you a homework assignment for this week. What I want you to do this week is to take an hour for God. Certainly you can take a lot more than that if you would like. I'd like you to unplug your computer, turn off your television, give your iPad to someone and ask them to hide it from you, leave your phone somewhere where you can't get to it, take your kids and drop them off at their grandparents and say, God, this hour is for you. And I want you to spend the first 20 minutes of that hour contemplating the fact that you did not have a beginning, that is, God did not have a beginning. Can you get your mind around that? No beginning, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's what I want you to do for the first 20 minutes. The second fact I want you to notice that we're going to talk about this morning is that God created all that there is. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting you are God. Colossians 1 verse 16, speaking about Jesus, says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. A crucial phrase, by him and for him. And to think that God did it out of nothing. I told you that out of nothing, nothing can arise. But since God existed, he could take nothing and create something. As you contemplate that, does your head hurt yet? <laughs> In fact, when God spoke, he created so many billions of stars. They say that there are many stars as there are sands on the seashore. And he did it with losing the Latin word ex nihilo, out of nothing. He just spoke. And suddenly they were all there in all their brilliance and beauty and the sun and the moon and the earth. Imagine God doing that. There's a story about a scientist who said to God, you know, God, I can do the same things you can do. I can take a handful of dirt and I can create life. God said, really, show me. So the guy reaches down and he takes a handful of dirt and God says, oh, wait a minute, get your own dirt. <laughs> if you want to prove that you're as good as God, go into a laboratory and spend an afternoon taking nothing and creating something and see how it goes. And so here's how I want you to spend your second 20 minutes of that hour. Contemplate the fact that God is the creator of all things. Take time to read Genesis 1 and 2 and marvel at the fact that God spoke and it was created. God spoke and this happened. Take an opportunity to read Psalm 139 and reflect on the fact that God is the creator of all that exists. And then there's the third fact that I want you to know about God in light of his eternality. Now remember, first, he is the uncaused God. He is eternal and he's always existed. Secondly, he created all things. And third, notice that he exists outside of time. Now, he comes into time, but he exists outside of time. And how do we know that God exists outside of time? Because time is a record of change. And what that means is that as long as God existed before creation, he said, I am the Lord and I change not. He is immutable. There was no change. And therefore, there was just an eternal now. Now, you may ask yourself the question, well, what was God doing before he created the worlds? I think it was the theologian John Calvin who said he's preparing a hell for people who ask questions like that. <laughs> we have no idea what God was doing. But we do know that he was in existence. We do know that he made choices. But those choices were eternal, as we're going to notice. <clears throat> we're going to study the fact that he never learns anything because, guess what? God knows it all. The fact is that God is the one who then who exists outside of time. Think about this for a moment. You're able to remember. But can you remember the future? Well, you say, I can't remember the future because it hasn't happened. But to God, the future has already happened. It's already a done deal. And it may be you've already pondered, why is it that we pray when God already knows all things? That's a huge question that a lot of Christians have. But I'm going to leave that for Pastor Jeff to answer some other time. <laughs> but here's the point. Let's say you have a map, and you know you're following this map, and you're taking this trail, and you go from one town to another, you take one road to another town, you're creating all these memories that you're going to remember. But think of God having the map spread out in front of him in its entirety, and he sees all things simultaneously. That's why the scripture can give us prophecies of things that will happen. What happened 4,000 years ago is just as present to God as what has happened this morning. Because all things are seen by God simultaneously. Where is that in our passage? In verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Or like a watch in the night. Peter says, with you one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Why? Because time is irrelevant to God. Because he sees everything in one present he does step out of eternity into time as we see through Christ, but the fact is that he does it all simultaneously. Makes my head hurt to think about that. For him, time does not exist because change does not exist. There's one story about a man who said to the Lord, Lord, how long is a million years to you? And God said, oh, it's about a minute. He said, God, how much is a million dollars to you? And God said, oh, about a penny. 
said, Lord, could I have just a penny? And the Lord said, sure, just a minute. <laughs> a thousand years are like a day, and a day like a thousand years. For God, time does not exist. Take the final 20 minutes of that hour contemplating that. And if you take that hour and contemplate these three things, you'll discover it's very difficult to concentrate on just those three because pretty soon you're thinking the same things over and over again. So may I suggest that you also try to read some other psalms, maybe the psalms in the 90s, 90 through 100, because I want you to spend an hour contemplating God, contemplating his greatness, contemplating his power and who he is through his word. And what you'll discover after that period of time is, when you've really reflected on who God is, you'll say, wow, if that's who God is, I'm here for whatever he wants. Another thing to do, maybe even tonight, if it's not cloudy, is to go outside and look up at the sky. See the stars. Be impressed with the immensity of God. If you go outside and there's no light pollution, you've ever been in the mountains where it's pitch black, it's absolutely amazing as to the number of stars, and they're the only ones that we can see from this planet in this mass universe. You see where I'm going with this? I want you to become impressed with who God is. Because many times we're like Moses is in this psalm. As I said, this psalm is a plaintive psalm. Moses, in fact, seems to be in a rather discouraging mood. And so what he does is in the next couple of verses is he contrasts us with God. In verse 3, he talks about the fact that men go back to dust. First of all, life is fleeting. He says in verse 5, you sweep men away in the sleep of death. They're like new grass of the morning. They spring up new, but by evening they're dry and withered. In verse 9, he says, we finish our years with a moan. Our life is but a vapor. In verse 10, he says, we fly away. He talks about the fact that our life is fleeting, our life is sinful. He says in verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Now, we've got all these secrets. We sin in secret. But to God, we're singing in, sinning in broad daylight because he sees everything. He talks about the fact that our life is full of trouble. At verse 10, the length of our days is 70 or 80 if we have the strength, or 100,000 or 102. <laughs> Moses is saying, you know what, it's all futile. You may live 80 years and a little beyond that, but most people don't, and life ends. See, Moses is really reflecting on the futility of life. There are criminals who live to the age of 80 or 90, yet there are young people with their life ahead of them, and they die aimlessly sometimes, sometimes because of their own sin. What is the purpose of life anyway? It's exasperating. It's frustrating. And we would all agree, if you cannot find meaning in life, it's all like a vapor. It's all being just turned back to dust. It's leaving life with unfinished tasks at the most inappropriate times. And if that's all life is, why live? Let's look at the psalm again, and maybe we can find an answer to why we live. Maybe an answer that some of us really need to hear today. First of all, it's really clear that God gives unity to history. God unifies it. He brings into unity what is happening in the world from one generation to another. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go, but God is there. Ministries are birthed and sometimes they die, but God is there. The same God who converted the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road is the same God who brought you to Christ, as well as Billy Graham, as well as your pastor. He's the same God who came to me and the same God who will convert future generations that are yet unborn. God is already planning to choose those generations and people from those generations to continue his work. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That is the bedrock of it all. But we look at the text and we find also that God gives purpose to life. And I want you to see that in the following verses. Some of the words that he uses as he ends this psalm that give us encouragement. For example, in verse 14 he says, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. That begins the process of meaning. If God loves me, and if I find God satisfying, I have purpose in life. C.S. Lewis said that God is the all-satisfying object. 
In the words of Augustine on the first page of his confessions, O God, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find they're all in thee. You see, what has happened is God has put eternity into our hearts, and yet we cannot experience eternity in this life. So life sometimes seems futile. But God comes along to satisfy us. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. Verse 15, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, as many years as we have seen trouble. Make us glad, gladness in the midst of trouble, gladness in the midst of failure, gladness in, gladness in the midst of unbelief. Yes, God is that kind of God. And Moses said, make us glad. We've blown it. But come along and give us hope. And that's exactly what God does. And he says in verse 17, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Can God look upon favor to a generation as Moses is writing that has rejected him? Yes. Because while they're there in the desert, he provides for them, he clothes them, he's working in their lives regardless of that. And so we come to the end of the psalm and he says, may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. What is the purpose of life when you live and then people forget you? And even if we're remembered, we'll be forgotten in a future generation. It's all temporary. You know, a lot of wealthy people give a lot of money to things so that their name can live on forever. Where do we find permanence? Where do we find that futility can be changed into meaning? We find because God establishes our works. Now, I told you that God exists in the eternal now. And I want you to think of history for a moment. Can you name those people who have been Sunday school teachers in this church from 50 or 100 years ago? What about ministry leaders in the church? Are there people who remember them? Did they write something? Probably not. You can go out to the cemetery here on the church grounds and you can look at the tombstones. Do you know any of those people or many of those people? They're not remembered, are they? They carried out their jobs, they did their best, they preached and taught the word of God, but they passed away. God has established their works, and those works, this is important, those works are as present to God as what we did for God this morning. He doesn't have to recall them because he instantly knows them. They're ever present before him, and he sees everything that they have done so that Jesus can say, even a cup of cold water in my name, which we have probably forgotten about, you will not lose your reward because I've established your works. Maybe you're a faithful Sunday school teacher. Maybe you're faithful in the obscurity of your job or your vocation. You're living for Christ in the midst of an environment that is hostile and you're representing Jesus well. Guess what, my friends? God takes note and he establishes those works and they will meet you after you die. You see, it makes a difference as to whether you or, not, you or I serve the Lord. There are probably some people here today listening to me who think that Christianity is going to church, listening to sermons, listening to music, and going home, and that's the end of the deal. But I will tell you that God has raised up here at Nielsville a marvelous ministry, as you know. But you're constantly short of people who are involved in the ministry and doing works for the glory of God. Everything that we do for Jesus is established, but if you want to have works that are established that will meet you on the other side, then you need to run and not walk to help out and minister in the church. Maybe it's with the children's ministry. Maybe it's with small groups. Maybe it's with ESL. Maybe it's with Sunday school. Maybe it's with the prayer ministry. And it's not just the ministries of the church. Wherever you work, whatever your vocation is, you are serving God. You serve God because you're delighted to be generous. And Jesus said, if you give, your reward is going to be in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, nor thieves break in and steal. God gives permanence to our fleeting, oftentimes frustrating lives that appear to be futile. God gives them permanence, and he is the one who establishes them. Now, there's a very important verse, and it's verse 12, and it says, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Now, you and I don't number our days, do we? If I asked you how old you were, you're not going to say to me, Oh, Gary, I'm 64,348 days old. You're going to give me years. But God says, number your days. 
Do you realize today you are younger than you will ever be again? <laughs> You're never going to be as young as you are today. So we should number our days because we don't know how many days we have left. What he's saying is that each day is an opportunity to serve the Lord, to find satisfaction in him and to do the works that are established over in heaven. So let me ask you a question. Do you know the God that I've been talking about this morning? When I say do you know him, I mean not just about him because you've listened to the sermon or read the Bible. Do you actually know him? And I don't want to be misheard. People misremember things. They mishear things. I've preached sermons where people come out and tell me I said something I don't even remember saying. <laughs> but I don't want you to mishear this. It's not through these works that you get to know God. Your introduction to God comes from another source, and I'll tell you exactly where it comes from. In John 17, when Jesus is praying to the Father, he says these words, and this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It all comes through Jesus because you and I have a big problem called sin. And because we have a sin problem, we cannot solve that problem on our own. And God's solution was to send his son, our savior, Jesus, whom we have to trust, personally acknowledging our sinfulness, coming to him and believing that he's the one who can clean us and bring us safely to the Father. He is the one that we love and he is the one that we follow. Jesus stepped out of eternity into time so that he could redeem us, so that he could take us back to himself, so that we in turn could enjoy eternity. And this is eternal life, not just a period of time, this is eternal life that we might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And our quest for permanence, our quest for meaning, and our quest to make sense out of life are finally answered. In this life, we don't get to do all the things we want. We live with disappointment, we live with heartache. But his day is coming when we not only enjoy the eternal life here, which Jesus gives us now, but we enjoy it over there where no good work done in the name of Jesus is ever lost because it's ever present before a God who is not bound by time. We serve a sovereign, great, immense, generous God, and it is to him that we come and dedicate ourselves. I encourage you to take time this week and contemplate God. Give him at least an hour. Become so acquainted with him that you begin to realize that really nothing else matters. And whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. I want you to be able to roll out of bed in the morning and say, God, today glorify yourself in my life at my expense. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter about me. It's all about God. And I long that something that I've done would be established eternally and my prayer is that you have that same longing and that same privilege. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father, what an incredible concept to reflect on the fact that you are an eternal God. But it excite, it's exciting to us to realize that because we realize, Lord, that everything we do for you is always present before you. We may do something in your name and forget about it, but you don't forget. You are a God who always remembers and you are a God who establishes the work of our hands. What a great gift and privilege that is to us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, gracious God, we do thank you again for that challenging yet comforting and encouraging word because we know that you're at work in us even now. Or we pray that we would take advantage of that time, be an hour, two hours, half hour, whatever, to compliment, contemplate just who you are, God. That it would just continue to give us a hunger and thirst for you. Thank you that you are the one who satisfies. Again, just continue to bless our congregation. Help us to continue to establish these works in the name of Jesus. Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing to this marvelous God.
six. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> 